Okay, so yeah, morning everyone again. Um, as we've already discussed, this morning's topic is blessings and cursings. And uh, we warmed ourselves up, as it were, to the themes of blessing anyway, with those three songs that we've just sung. And uh, just by the sheer number of references to the term blessing, it really does seem that to be to be blessed by God, it really seems like an important part of the Bible and the Christian experience. To be blessed by God feels like, to me anyway, um, my personal feeling on the word blessing is that we're seeking God's favor. If God truly is a God of love, and if he's a God of mercy and kindness, then I want that love, mercy, and kindness to rest upon me. You know, we say things like, please God, bless me. We ask for God to bless others. We ask for him to love us, to have mercy upon us, and to be kind to us. Perhaps evidence of that love, mercy, and kindness can equate to good health and long life. Maybe it's comfortable living and not struggling financially. Perhaps it's having family and friends who can also experience those same things. So when I read through the Bible, does my personal feeling on blessing match up with what the Bible says about blessing? And am I on the right track? Or is there more to being blessed by God than what I've just described? And so that's what brought us here, brought me here to this topic. So let's look at our first verse in Ephesians. It's verses like Ephesians 1 verse 3, which inspire this kind of thinking I have about blessing. And it reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And here we have a lot of blessing mentioned in one sentence. We bless God, who has blessed us with all of his blessings. And in the Greek, all three blessings come from the same family of words. The Greek word uh, here is eulogio, and we actually get the English word eulogy from it. And just like the eulogies we have at funerals, it means to speak well of, to adore, and to commend. You know, when we're, when we're at a funeral and people go up and, and, and say the eulogy, we're talking about the best in people when we give those eulogies. And when we bless someone or someone is blessing us, it's the same thing. We want the best for that person. And then in Hebrew, the word bless, it literally means to kneel or to show favor and respect. So when we like and respect someone, we should want the best for them. And when we hear the word bless in the Old Testament, God was actually showing his favor towards his people and wanting the best for them. So then in contrast, I haven't even mentioned the second part of the topic, and that is the word cursing. And we'll get to that throughout the talk, but at least for now, remember these meanings of the word bless. That is to show favor, to respect, to speak well of, and to adore. Okay, so let's go right back to the beginning of the Bible and let's see how early the words blessing and then curse will appear in the Bible. Well, the story of the Bible begins with God bringing life out of the dark, chaotic waters and with him ordering our beautiful world. Now, there are two moments in the first chapter of Genesis where God blesses and in each time it is an effective blessing. And an effective blessing, well, that means that it, is, it isn't just words that God is speaking, because God's words, they have power, and God's words, they have purpose. God's words bring into reality the things that God is saying. In other words, when God speaks, <clears throat> it happens. So let's see exactly what the blessings were that God gave. The first time the Bible describes God's blessings is in Genesis 1 verse 22. And you'll notice I've got Genesis 1 verse 28 on, on the screen, but they say very similar things. But in Genesis 1 verse 22, God is speaking first to the birds and the sea creatures. 
And in verse 22, it says that God blessed them. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. So God's first blessings are associated with flourishing and multiplication of life. God was sharing his life-giving abilities. They could only multiply in their own kind. So it wasn't God's full abilities that were being given, but God blessed them nonetheless. Remember the meanings of the word bless, things like to speak well of, etc. Well, as God is creating, what he was also saying, what was he also saying at the end of each day? He was saying it is good. He was speaking well of his creation. In a way, he was speaking a blessing upon his blessing, making it sure and setting it in place. He would then repeat the exact same words to humans and land creatures in verse 28, which I've got here on the screen. And it says, God bless them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Again, here is God sharing his life, giving abilities with the creatures of the land. But to the humans, he gives an additional blessing, which we read at the end of this verse. And that's, that's a blessing which set humans apart from the rest of God's creation. Humans were not only given the ability to generate new life, again, only in their kind, but they were also appointed as God's representative image to rule and to oversee this flourishing new world that God had created on God's behalf. Being created in the image of God is not only limited to any physical attributes we share, but also includes his dominion and authority. Part of the blessing to humans was to take care of the creation that God had blessed and in turn be a blessing to creation as well, creating an abundance of blessing from all sides. Now, while all of this was happening, God wanted the humans, and this all started with Adam and Eve, to trust in him and in his abundance. He wanted to be the blessing to humans while they were meant to be a blessing to God's creation, which in turn would return a blessing back to God. He wanted humans to come under his authority and rule while we had authority and rule over his creation. And then this is where things start to get interesting. So from this side of thing, everything is working well. As God said, it is good. But we'd soon see that things took a turn for the worst. To test Adam and Eve's willingness to come under God's authority, God then placed trees around them in their home in the Garden of Eden. And the first tree that was mentioned is a tree of God's ultimate blessing. We know that as the tree of life. This tree would allow humans to partake of God's blessings forever, an eternal blessing. And Adam and Eve were allowed to eat from this tree as often as they liked. However, there was another tree, and this other tree, well, this tree seemed like it was also a tree that had blessing associated with it. But God explained to Adam and Eve that it was actually a tree with a curse. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God even told them that this tree was cursed, as Eve said herself in Genesis 3 verse 3. God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Because you see death, it was death that was the curse promised for the disobedience of eating from that tree. So to test if Adam and Eve would indeed come under his authority, God gave them this one and only rule. Just one rule. Don't touch. Don't eat from this particular tree. Now we know what happened. Adam and Eve did indeed eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They chose to seize God's blessing on their own terms, by their own reasoning and their own wisdom. They seek to bless themselves more than to bless God. And they saw this tree as a shortcut to this blessing, thanks to the distorted lies and reasoning of the serpent, where they then thought, why would God put this tree here? if he didn't really want us to partake of it. This tree is a blessing. 
we won't die if we eat from this tree. Instead, we'll know everything. We'll know the knowledge. We'll have knowledge of the difference between good and evil. It will be an ultimate blessing that God wants us. And that ultimate blessing is to be like him. So they ate. But they soon realized that instead of being a blessing, this tree did indeed bring a curse, exactly as God had promised. As we know, Adam and Eve were exiled from the garden, and they quickly found out the consequences of attempting to seize their own blessing. Aside from their exile from the garden, they also brought curses upon the very creation they had been given dominion and authority over. Instead of being a blessing to creation, they actually became a curse as death and decay spread and seeped into every aspect of creation. And likewise, creation became a curse to humans as conditions changed for the worse. Instead of being an optimal paradise, thorns and thistles and weeds now started to grow and man was going to have to uh, take his living from the ground by the sweat of his brow. Where there once was abundance in life, they began to see scarcity, isolation, and death. Where humans were meant to rule together peaceably and in harmony, instead there is a long history in the Bible of power struggles and suffering, whether between men, between women, or between men and women, whether strangers, close friends, or even relatives, the Bible is full of war, death, murder, rape, and many other really unpleasant situations that sometimes can actually be quite hard to read. The Bible is brutally honest in its depiction of humans under the curse of sin. It doesn't try to paint a rosy picture at all. It's raw and it's unfiltered in many of its depictions. It purposely does this to show that the curse is tough. The curse is real and it's almost impossible to break. But thankfully, even after Adam and Eve's failures, the story doesn't end there. And the Bible isn't only filled with violence and bloodshed. The Bible is also filled with hope, love, and redemption. God, right from uh, the time that he dished out the first curses, he also made promises that would, uh, that would slowly but surely start the process of restoring his blessings. He promises Eve a descendant, and God called that descendant a seed, one who would break the curse. He would crush it and restore paradise. We know that descendant to be Jesus. Jesus was the promised curse crusher, but it was still going to take some time to get to his generation, and there was still a lot of work to be done before the birth of this promised seed. In the meantime, would people learn to trust God and receive his blessings under this new uh, regime, under these new conditions that the curse had brought about? Unlike the failure of Adam and Eve, uh, whose trust had wavered. One couple who we read about in the Bible who eventually learned to trust God and to receive his blessings and promises were Abraham and Sarah. Now, like Adam and Eve, they were given very similar promises. God promised he would bless them and make them a huge family, as many as the stars in the sky or the sands on the shore. Like Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Adam's blessing was to extend to the nations of the world and to his one seed, as it says in Galatians 3 verse 16. This one seed it was referring to was that all-important descendant, Jesus. The same Jesus, the same curse crusher that was promised to Eve generations before. Now, also like Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah had their missteps. They tried to bring about the blessing of a son on their own terms by their own reasoning and wisdom. This resulted in the birth of Ishmael through Sarah's slave, Hagar. This in turn resulted in Sarah mistreating Hagar. And all it did was bring more power struggles, more conflict 
that could have easily been avoided if Abraham and Sarah just held fast to the promises of God and his timing. In fact, Sarah laughed when she heard these promises of God herself. We know that this wasn't a laugh of amazement of joy because she then denied laughing right to an angel's face when she was asked about it. Her laugh was one of unbelief and doubt because she felt she was beyond the age of childbearing. She didn't think it was possible, not even for God. Abraham and Sarah, through all of their scheming, missteps and doubt, were threatening to bring more curses and hardships upon themselves and those around them and repeat the mistakes of Adam and Eve before them. They believed in the promises of God, but their ideas of how this was going to be possible, that was the part that was in conflict with God's plan. However, God continued to work through them. He continued to renew his promises of blessing to them and be patient with them. And they eventually came through. Eventually, Abraham, he learned to surrender his will to God. He allowed God to work and his faith became stronger because Abraham had developed a tested faith. Sarah once again laughed when her son Isaac was born. Even the name Isaac actually means laughter. But this time, Sarah laughed in astonishment and joy. No more doubts, and there were no more schemes. They had seen a major step in God's blessings in their lives, and they were holding him in their hands. Now, eventually, Abraham's family did grow just as God had promised. Over many generations, Abraham's family became particularly large, and God had his eyes set on one part of that large family group that he, wanted to, that he wanted to bless abundantly. He looked towards the 12 tribes of Israel. God remembered his promises and pulled this group, this family out of Egypt and from the curse of slavery. From Egypt, God led Israel to a mountain and appeared to them there. And it was there that God invited Israel to be his representatives, to be his image and to be his blessing to all the nations just like he had promised to, Abraham, uh, to Adam and Eve and to Abraham and Sarah. All they had to do was trust and live by God's wisdom, just like he had said to Adam and Eve and to um, Abraham and Sarah, just to live by his wisdom. And he gave that wisdom to them in the form of the law. And in this law, there was a choice, a choice between good and evil, life and death, blessing and cursing. He even placed them later on in two mountains, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. And he called Mount Gerizim the mountain of blessing and Ebal he called the mountain of cursing. Again, all of this sounds very familiar with what we've heard about with Adam and Eve and their choice to obey God, not through two mountains, but through the two trees. Would they trust in God and choose the tree of life on Mount Gerizim? Or would they trust in their own devices and wisdom through a tree of knowledge and good and evil upon Mount Ebal? Also, very similar to the story of Adam and Eve, Israel also at almost every turn chose not to trust God. The Bible is filled with more stories of mistrust, deception and violence from this period of history. Only a very select few chose to obey God, and those select few stand out as those blessed by God. A lot of these people were prophets, men and women who continued to believe in the promises of God. They would plead with the nation of Israel to return to the promises of the blessing. But there was a problem. Israel thought they were already blessed. Here we are in our land. We're safe and secure. We're rich. What else do we need? But the prophets warned the people that they had forgotten God and his ways and that there was a curse coming. Do not be wise in your own eyes, they would say. Obey God or face invasion and then exile. Again, some listened, but most did not. And the prophets also prophesied in amongst all of this unbelief, a continued promise of hope and a restoration back towards the true blessing. 
they would speak of the promised seed that we have heard of as the curse crusher. He was a future king, a man who would restore the nation of Israel. He would restore their land and all of their intended blessings. And then they also would share that it wasn't going to be just for Israel that these blessings would come, but for all nations of the earth. And throughout all of these themes that we've just been looking at, and you can see the similarities between Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, the nation of Israel, you see that theme running right through. This theme eventually leads us to Jesus, the promised Messiah. Jesus uh, would then start to minister, and he had a lot to say about blessing for those who loved and obeyed God. And they're called the Beatitudes, and we read about those in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Bless, bless, bless. Jesus, he wanted to reverse the curse, and he knew he had, he had the key part to play in God's plan. He wanted, and he still wants, his followers to trust in God's abundance, to share, and to be generous, and to even bless people who curse us. Uh, in 1 Peter 3 verse 9, never retaliate when someone treats you wrongly, nor insult those who insult you, but instead respond by speaking a blessing over them, because a blessing is what God promised to give you. Jesus went out of his way to reverse the curse by healing and restoring people's bodies and health. But this didn't go down well with the religious leadership of Israel. Instead of celebrating Jesus and helping him to restore the blessing, um, they didn't see Jesus as the tree of life to the people. Instead, they were always trying to hinder people, uh, to hinder Jesus. They created barriers and obstacles in front of him in the hope of tripping him up. This showed that the leaders were just like the serpent who first tricked Eve in the Garden of Eden. These leaders trusted, just like so many before them, in their own clever devices and in their own wisdom. It was these leaders who, after many meetings and discussions, decided to have Jesus arrested, to have him killed, and to get him out of their way. And they said this, that it was all in the name of God. But Jesus knew better. Jesus believed so strongly in the promises of God that he was willing to surrender himself to these authorities. He passed every test and command God had given him right up until the point of the cross. Just through his teachings alone, he had already been a blessing to the nations. But that was not enough to be the curse crusher. Jesus had admitted to God in the Garden of Gethsemane that he was willing to surrender his will completely to God when he said, not my will, but yours be done. But an unproven faith is just theory. And just as Abraham before him showed God that he had attested faith when he was willing to sacrifice his, his son Isaac, this was Jesus' time to show that the proof was in the pudding for him as well that he too would have a tested faith, a complete faith. Unlike all of those before him who had fallen short after receiving the promises of God, Jesus did not attempt to control the blessing his way. He was willing to go on whatever journey God took him. He definitely sweated out while doing so, but he never wavered once in his obedience and faithfulness. Now, to be hung on a tree or a pole, such as the cross, was, was considered a curse in the law of Moses. 
And although Jesus was nothing but blessed by God, he was willing to accept any form of curse in order to reverse it and return it as a blessing. And in Galatians 3, verse 13 to 14, we read, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is anyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. You see, by dying on the cross and then being raised back to eternal life, Jesus had finally fulfilled his destiny as the curse crusher, the first human to live a completely sinless, 100% faithful life. His sacrifice was seen by God as an allowance to forgive the sins of others. Those who called upon his name would have the power to be forgiven. We, like Jesus, though, if we call upon his name, must be willing to surrender our will to his. We must choose to obey and listen to God and allow his blessing to come to us in his timing and in his way. We mustn't seize God's blessing on our own terms, by our own reasoning, or by our own wisdom. We must choose God's wisdom. Now, sure, there will always be times when we cannot live up to the high calling that we've been called to, and we will fall short and fail. But at all times and in all things, we can call upon the name of Jesus, asking God through that name to forgive us. Jesus is the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. Jesus is the promise given to Abraham. Jesus is Mount Gerizim. Jesus is the blessing. And it is through Jesus that we will one day have eternal life, that we will receive all of those promises given in the Bible, and we will go up to the mountain of the Lord to receive those blessings. So until that day, let's all continue asking for ourselves and asking for everyone else. Let's ask God to bless us and to keep us, to have his face shine upon us and to be gracious to us, to lift up his countenance upon us and to give us all that perfect peace. And while we're asking for those things, may we continue to offer blessings and praise back to God to show him that we love him, that we respect him, that we know that, that we believe in his promises and that our faith, that we're willing to show that our faith can be a tested faith as well. Uh, no matter what God puts us through, no matter what tests and trials we go through, may it be that God will bless us. May it be that God will be able to help us through. May it be that God will show that his blessing rests upon us. Amen, and God bless you all. Do you want to just unshare your screen there for us, Morris? Um, sure. How do I do that? Stop share. I found it. <laughs> well done there, buddy. Thank you so much for that. That was awesome. Um, we come to the time of communion now. Um, anybody offering to um, pray over the bread and the wine? Very good. Okay. Yeah, I will. Thank you, sir. Once again, Father, we thank you that on this wet, windy, rainy day, we've been able to remain in our homes under our own roof, safe from the, uh, the weather, and yet uh, remain in contact um, in fellowship with each other, separated by kilometres, but able to see one another, able to talk to one another, and to receive that word of exhortation from our brother Morris this morning. I think if our ancestors could see us doing this, they might think heaven must have already come. But uh, we know heaven hasn't come, but some amazing blessings have come that you have granted um, through the intelligence that you have gr uh, granted man. We know that you did promise that in the time of the end, knowledge would be increased. And uh, we have certainly benefited from the increased knowledge of technology, but also the increased knowledge um, of your word. But in spite of the amazing increase of, of the technology of man, we know that he's, he's no further ahead with us in respect of gaining eternal life. 
And although there are some amazing surgeries, some amazing um, medications and all sorts of other procedures that can deal with uh, certain maladies, we know, Lord, that death is still a curse, death is still a reality, and that man has not got the knowledge or the wisdom or the mm. power to deal with it. But as we come now to the central part of our meeting of remembering our Lord Jesus Christ by the partaking of bread and wine, we thank you, Lord, that what man has been unable to do, you have done, and you have provided a way. You have provided an escape from the curse um, of death, and you provided in your only begotten son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, this morning, we thank you. We thank you for him. Truly, without him, life would be meaningless. It would be absolutely hopeless, frustrating, and depressing. But because of him, we have great joy in our lives and great expectation of the day when he's going to come again and totally redeem us, glorifying us in our bodies, making them like unto his glorious body and uh, removing all the curses that our brother Morris has been talking about, re-establishing your kingdom and restoring the paradise that you originally set up in the days of Adam and Eve. So, Lord, we have an amazing hope. Mm. We have an amazing future to look forward to. And it's all because of your purpose in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you again this morning for moving into our lives and drawing us to you through him. We thank you, Lord, for granting us a revelation that he is the Christ, he is the Son of God, he is the Saviour of the world. As your word says, no man can come mm. to him unless you draw him by your Holy Spirit, and you certainly have. So we pray for your blessing now as we remember him in the bread and the wine. Amen. Thank you. 